Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to AESP Convergent COVID-19, Environment, Health and Equity. The name is Maya Trotz, and I am um, the co-chair of this conference, and we'd really like to welcome you to our fifth session, which looks at um, designing a future without pollution and waste. Some logistics we are recording this webinar. And so with this announcement, you are being recorded. Um, some directions for today. It, the best way to look at the webinar is to do side-by-side -side view on your screen. Um, and so this is something that you control on your computer. For some of you, this is a drop-down menu that you would use to click that. Um, we do have sign language interpretation. And so that's best seen in, and so that's best seen in side-by-side -side mode. We also have closed captioning, which you can adjust at the bottom of your Zoom panel. We want you to ask questions for our panelists. And so we encourage you to send them through the Q&A. If you're watching on YouTube Live, you can also post questions there or tweet us um, with the hashtag AESP Converging COVID-19. Now I'd like to play a short video welcoming you to our conference. The Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors, AESP, is made up of professors and academic programs throughout the world who provide education in the sciences and technologies of environmental protection. As hard as we work in our domain expertise, we need to work equally as hard to build positive human relationships with our colleagues, our students, and the communities that we serve. We will continue to work towards a more just, equitable, and healthy society. The goal of the virtual conference Converging COVID-19, Environment, Health, and Equity is to bring together different disciplines of environmental engineering and science to discuss actions to form a more healthy, just, and equitable society. The conference themes align with the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's grand challenges for environmental engineering in the 21st century. And they are... COVID-19, Systemic Biases, and Environmental Engineering and Education. COVID-19, fostering informed decisions and actions. COVID-19 and the creation of efficient, healthy, and resilient cities. COVID-19 and sustainably supplying food, water, and energy. COVID-19 and designing a future without pollution and waste. COVID-19 and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Each session, as much as possible, will look at the convergence of air, water, wastewater, food, People, the built environment, waste, fostered by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the unfolding realities of the need to address inequities in our communities. Faculty from the University of South Florida and the University of California, Merced, are pleased to hold this virtual conference with support from AESP and the National Science Foundation's CBET program. I'd now like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Colleen Naughton. Dr. Naughton is also the conference co-chairperson and co-PI. She is an assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of California, Merced. And she serves on the AESP Government Affairs Committee. Um, she's a former science and technology policy fellow through the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Naughton's research focuses on designing sustainable and culturally sensitive food, energy, water systems. And she is really the brainchild behind this um, conference. So I will ask Dr. Naughton to take it over from here. Thank you, Dr. Trotz, for that kind introduction. I would uh, say you're the brainchild of this conference, but thank you uh, for the thoughts. Uh, so welcome everyone, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending when you're watching this. I'd first like to pause to acknowledge all local indigenous peoples, including the Yokuts and Miwok, who inhabited the land of University of California Merced. We embrace their continued connection to this region 
and thank them for allowing us to live, work, learn, and collaborate on their traditional homeland. Uh, next, I would like to dedicate this session to my grandmother or Nana. Uh, her name was Marian Jaroski, and she passed away this Tuesday. She would have appreciated this session on designing a future without pollution or waste. She was one of the first to teach me about the environment. I remember how she would clean all of her recyclables and neatly bind the papers and separate paper, plastic, and metal before we had single stream recycling. Uh, she was also a young girl growing up after the Great Depression, and she really did not like to waste anything, uh, food or material. Uh, she did not live to see a future without pollution or waste, but hopefully her grandchild, myself, and uh, those after me will le live to see a future without pollution or waste. According to the World Bank, the world generates 2 billion tons of municipal solid waste annually, one third of which are not properly managed or managed safely. Every year, an estimated one third of food is produced is wasted, equivalent to 1.3 billion tons uh, by consumers, retailers, and from inefficient transportation and harvesting practices. In 2015, one in every six deaths was attributed to a disease from exposure to pollution. Air pollution in particular causes 7 million uh, premature deaths worldwide. And there's 300 million tons of plastic waste produced every year, according to the United Nations Environment Program. COVID-19 has caused further challenges for pollution and waste. The food supply chain was disrupted and tons of crops were overturned. Millions of gallons of milk were dumped and millions of hogs were euthanized prematurely. We've seen an explosion of personal protective equipment, litter and waste, gloves and masks that are made of petroleum products that are already turning up in our oceans, streams and rivers. Though initial lockdowns decreased some air pollutants, it did not reduce all and studies show that exposure to air pollution can make people more susceptible to COVID-19 and more serious illness. Despite these sobering statistics, there are solutions. Today we have an amazing panel lined up to touch in many different aspects of the grand challenges to design a future without pollution or waste. From different approaches to solid waste management during COVID-19, working with communities and innovating food and wastewater, air pollution during COVID-19, particularly for underserved communities, transportation and decarbonizing during the uncertainty of COVID-19 and a future with green chemistry. So I'd like to first introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sunny Ivey. Dr. Ivey is an assistant professor of chemical and environmental engineering at the University of California, Riverside. Her research centers on developing and applying advanced air quality monitoring and data fusion approaches to characterize air pollution in the United States. These advanced approaches are used to answer questions related to community scale exposure and source characterization. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ivy. Good morning. I'm Dr. Sunny Ivy, again, a third year professor of chemical and environmental engineering at UC Riverside. Today, I'm going to briefly discuss the activity and emissions trends of the COVID-19 shutdown followed by a discussion of the implications of these activity changes for air pollution, future mitigation, and how these factors are disproportionately impacting environmental justice communities. So it's well known by now that the COVID-19 shutdown led to substantial changes in human activity, such as the reduction in vehicle miles traveled, air travel, industrial production, and building energy consumption. More locally in Southern California, peak reductions in vehicle miles travel occurred in mid-April and gradually uh, began to rebound. Presently, traffic flow has not returned to pre-COVID levels in the South Coast Air Basin. And we also saw that traffic reductions were not spatially uniform where coastal counties saw greater reductions than the inland counties um, potentially, this is due to a higher fraction of essential workers in the inland counties. Next slide, please. So the Los Angeles Basin has a unique combination of meteorology, atmospheric chemistry, and topography 
that makes our region susceptible to higher levels of air pollution. While primary air pollution such as tailpipe emissions have more local impacts, secondary pollution such as ozone um, and secondary PM can be more spatially homogeneous within several thousand meters. Our South Coast Air Quality Management District carries out uh, regular studies of cancer risk in the basin, formerly known as the MATES studies. And what they found is that the risk per million for cancer actually strongly coincides with highways and intermodal transport facilities, uh, such as rail yards and shipping ports. So in recent years, the state of California actually mandated that we increase the resources that should be invested to address community exposure disparities, um, which are most often seen or most often observed in um, black, brown and indigenous communities in Southern California. So in both figures on the right, I've actually highlighted the three phase one environmental justice communities. And of particular interest is the Wilmington West Long Beach Carson community. The graphic on the left is credited to Martha Dina Agulo and presents a very sobering image of the disparities in COVID-19 cases near this community. The cases per 100,000 uh, people are indicated by the dark dots and the census tracts are colored by the Cal and virus green score. And the red colors in it indicate the tracts that have more vulnerable communities. And so we can clearly see that the COVID cases are highest in the most vulnerable census tracts. Um, however, this, this figure actually inspires this following question. Um, given that it's air pollution exposure has been identified as an important risk for a uh, risk factor for COVID-19 mortality, specifically for secondary pollution like PM 2.5, why aren't the COVID cases more homogeneous in this particular area of Southern California? Please go to the next slide. So the answer really lies in inequitable land use. Inequitable land use is actually what's leading to these higher levels of primary air toxic emissions in vulnerable communities. Specific examples of these uh, include uh, upzoning in black, brown and indigenous communities, which leads to an influx of hazardous facilities into the communities. Another example is the deliberate construction of highways in vulnerable communities, which leads to higher exposures of traffic related pollution and the land use changes near residential communities will degrade air quality and subsequently degrade early childhood education due to chronic illnesses. It lowers property values and it confines vulnerable communities and limits social mobility and hinders the flexibility to migrate away from these locations. Um, sadly, these are artifacts of redlining in after the Great Depression. Next slide. So moving forward, we need to consider the historical context of inequitable land use when we're addressing air pollution exposure disparities. First, we need to be more aware of the disproportionate generation of consumption and waste across ethnic demographics, where black and brown and, and indigenous communities generate less pollution, but we're exposed to more pollution than white communities. We should also push for policies that penalize unsustainable development in historically underserved communities. Next slide, please. Finally, in terms of technology interventions, we need to push for zero emissions technologies that eliminate toxic air pollutions, which will actually benefit all populations. Further, um, I think we've seen that working from home whenever possible reduces the disproportionate impact of traffic related pollutants on all communities. And with that, please feel free to contact me if you'd like to discuss anything I've presented today. Thank you, Dr. Ivy, for that uh, great presentation and highlighting the historical environmental inequities uh, related to air pollution. Next, I'd like to introduce our, introduce our second speaker, Dr. Jiyoung uh, Choi. Dr. Choi is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Florida A&M University, Florida State University College of Engineering. He leads the Sustainable and Resilient Infrastructure Laboratory 
to address emerging issues facing critical infrastructure systems, which spans from aging infrastructure to climate change, sustainability, and post-disaster resiliency. Dr. Choi received an NSF National Science Foundation rapid grant to look at COVID-19 and its impact on municipal solid waste management facilities. Please join me in welcoming our second panelist. Yeah, thank you, Colleen, for your kind introduction. Um, my name is Jiyoung Choi, and in this presentation, I would like to talk about how we can make our waste management systems resilient enough to keep the environment clean and minimize the potential spread of the infectious disease. Next slide, please. So our waste management services are a kind of a system which consists of multiple entities and their interaction. For example, next. Please, yes. Once waste is collected by either recycling trucks, waste collectors, or people from residential areas and local businesses, the collected waste will proceed to different facilities such as transfer station and landfill sites. Although different waste management systems offer similar services, but their systems are unique in terms of what entities exist in the system, how these entities in interact with one another, and please click, please next, yes. Who owns and manage these facilities? In response to uh, these challenges, each system has adopted each system differently. For instance, as you can see from the slide, in order to accommodate a spike in the volume of residential waste, some systems stopped picking up yard waste and focused their resources on the collection of residential waste, which resulted in a change in the interaction uh, between waste collectors and residential customers. Also, please, next, please. Um, due to the limited PPE for waste workers, other local government agencies and volunteer organizations become important part of the system. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at two waste management systems, one system in Florida and the other one in California, and compare them to see how they have responded differently during the pandemic. This is one of the uh, waste management system in Florida, in, in, as you can see in this slide. The waste to energy facilities is the primary means of disposal to this system. From the waste generation source, commercial and residential waste is collected in two ways. Transport by customers themselves to the collection point and the collection by the waste collectors. Uh, next slide, please. In the beginning of the pandemic, around like April, this system faced lots of challenges and had to, uh, take, had to take a lot of adaptive measures. Next, please. In particular, uh, there was suspension of household hazardous waste services due to the difficulty in maintaining social distances. And also, next. Material recovery facilities were suspended and all of the recyclables uh, were diverted to waste energy facility due to the concern about recycling contamination. As a result, some of the interactions between entities were removed, as you can see in this slide. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the second system in California. There are three main sources of the waste stream residential, commercial, and industry roll-off. Please note that unlike system one, this system mainly relies on material recovery facility and composting facility to treat the, any incoming uh, daily waste and does not have a waste energy facilities in the system since California does not allow for having a incineration facilities in the system. Next, please. Like system one in Florida, this system also experienced lots of challenges and took uh, uh, various adaptive measures in the beginning of the pandemic. But unlike system one, 
there was no change in interactions between system entities. In particular, next please. In response to the concern about the recycling contamination, the system addressed uh, this concern by allowing the recyclables to stay for a longer period before sorting instead of diverting the recyclables to other disposal facilities. In other words, two systems have responded to even the same challenge differently. Next, please. So different systems may face their own unique challenges and respond differently. Next, please. Then how can we develop a plan for future pandemic events? Next. We believe that our rapid project can develop an informational database where a local waste management system can find and adapt the best measurement practices based on their regional context and system characteristics. Next. Similarly, other extreme events such as natural disasters cause lots of challenges to local waste management systems. And we believe that such accumulated knowledge help us to uh, res uh, help us respond to such disruptive events in a more sustainable and effective way. Thank you. And this is the, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Choi, for that great presentation. I'd next like to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Shakira Hobbs. Dr. Shakira Hobbs is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Hobbs' scholarship explores multidisciplinary approaches to sustainable engineering, international development, and life cycle thinking applied to the food energy water nexus. Her research her area of research focuses on developing methods to manage anthropogenic activity, such as converting waste to energy and modeling transport of pesticides. In 2018, she founded BioGals, a US nonprofit organization that works internationally empowering women of color to create sustainable solutions. I highly recommend you check it out. Dr. Hobbs received some seed funding uh, from National Science Foundation as well for wastewater assessment for coronavirus in Kentucky or WACI. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hobbs. Thank you, Colleen. It's an honor to be here and I will briefly talk about working with communities and in innovating with food water and wastewater, food waste and wastewater. The world is healing. We saw environmental conditions improve and more wildlife roaming in cities. Watching this happen during COVID-19 highlighted the stark reality and the effects pollution and waste have on environment due to human activity. Today, I wanna to talk to you about two fascinating ways waste can be utilized to help answer COVID-19 related questions and food waste as an energy source. Next slide. Fragments of SARS-CoV-2 found in wastewater can be used to surveillance the currents of people with COVID-19. A group of researchers and I were awarded NIH seed funding to investigate coronavirus in Kentucky via wastewater. The fragments we are interested in are ribonucleic acid, RNA, inside of the virus. The RNA is a living cell, is, is in all living cells, and its role is to act as a messenger. Uh, next, please. Carrying information about the virus. We can use that information to detect the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. Next slide. We collected wastewater samples from the wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater was autoclaved and spiked with synthetic SARS-CoV-2 RNA to simulate a positive person shedding the virus. The samples were put under three different environmental conditions. The RNA was extracted from the wastewater using exclusion-based sample preparation and analyzed using polymerase chain reaction. Next slide. Eight different experiments were used to evaluate the aging of SARS-CoV-2 under various conditions. We're looking at these conditions because these are various environmental stressors the samples may be under during transport to the lab for analysis. Next slide. The copies of SARS-CoV-2 are still present at day three for most samples. 
However, no copies are present after a week. This assists with understanding the factors that influence the degradation and time period in which wastewater samples need to be analyzed to make an informed decision. For example, rural areas may be located far from labs, labs for analysis and or may be in conditions that accelerate the degradation of SARS-CoV-2 RNA. COVID-19 taught us about disparities and how we need effective solutions to help our most vulnerable communities. We've seen this technology be deployed at college dorms, nursing homes, shelters, and prisons. Additional vulnerable communities that could benefit from this are rural communities in low to mid-income countries with septic tanks and trench latrines. Since I've been working with, next slide please. Since I've been working with the rural village in Belize, I became aware of how important it is to involve communities in the decision-making process. I've been working with City River Village in Belize since 2015 and maintain, and the main method for managing their waste is burning, burying, and dumping trash in the river. The community wanted to explore methods for managing organic waste. Next slide. The spider graph on the right shows current waste management techniques. These are how things are currently ran and community members want to go from larger area to smaller area. Next, the introduction of biodigesters or anaerobic digestion to manage food waste reduce the area. Anaerobic digestion is a renewable energy technology that converts organic waste like food waste to energy. Next slide. With the community, we identify anaerobic digestion as a viable method for managing food waste and utilizing biogas to cook school lunches. We had several interactions with community members designing the prototype and testing it with the community. We spent a lot of time at the school engaging with, with primary school kids um, and uh, introducing them to anaerobic digestion. We built a pilot scale digester with the local construction company. Lastly, women of color that join me on these trips gain a sense of belonging and, and identify more with being an engineer. And this is just a clip of us loading the digester. Next slide. From session, sessions three and four, we talked a lot about resource recovery from wastewater. I briefly demonstrated ways we can amplify the value of waste, resource, recover resources, and engage community and in technology integration. Due to COVID-19, it's been challenging coordinating international research, but there have been opportunities to support knowledge exchange. Next. Finally, it's important to continue this work because of the impact it continues to have on women of color in engineering. Here are some of the colleagues who accompanied me to Belize and worked on this work with me. All are continuing in engineering as faculty members, postdoctoral scholars, recent graduate, project engineers, an environmental engineer for a government agency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs, for that great presentation and all your research and work with the community. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Costa Samaras. Dr. Samaras is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and affiliated faculty in the Energy Science, Energy Science Technology and Policy Program at Carnegie Mellon University. His research spans energy, climate change, automation, and defense analysis. Dr. Samaras analyze, analyzes how energy technology and infrastructure system design affect energy use and national security, resilience to climate change impacts, economic and equity outcomes, and life cycle environmental emissions and other externalities. Dr. Samaras regularly provides commentary to online print, radio, and television media. So you may have seen his articles in the New York Times Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and other outlets. He has presented his research to senior appointed governmental leaders as well. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Samaras. Thank you so much, Dr. Naughton, for that excellent introduction and very kind introduction. I'm really grateful to be here, and I'm going to talk about shaping the future of the U.S. transportation system under uncertainty from COVID-19. I'd like to thank the great graduate students that I work with, and specifically Abdullah Al-Arfaj, who is working on this topic with me, and Professor Mike Griffin. Next slide, please. 
Okay, since this is a session about pollution reduction, I'm gonna start with a pollution control device from the 19th century, this is a boot scraper. And so with each horse producing about 15 to 30 pounds of manure per day, multiplied by hundreds of thousands of horses in a city, the boot scraper enabled you to remove, I don't know, 75%, 80% of this pollution from your shoes before you went to your home, right? But the transition to automobiles albeit powered with leaded gasoline, solved this problem, but it introduced a lot of new ones. Next slide, please. Civil and environmental engineers, urban planners and architects shape the future. In a lot of places in the United States, this is our current le legacy. Neighborhoods and livelihoods were bisected by concrete and pollution has disproportionately and continuously affected communities of color the next transportation system has to be different. Next slide. We have a huge challenge in decarbonizing transportation. Um, transportation is now the largest source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And within the transportation se sector, emissions from cars and SUVs, that's the blue area here, is the largest source. Uh, the emissions from aviation is the red area and the emissions from uh, freight trucking, uh, primarily from freight trucking is in the yellow area here. All right, so what does this mean? Well, see the dotted line there is an 80% reduction in transportation emissions. This means we're gonna have to reduce emissions from all of these sectors below that line to get an 80% reduction in transportation emissions. But uh, there's more, we don't need an 80% reduction we need emissions to go to zero. We heard from Dr. Ivy that COVID-19 has reduced activity in electricity use, in transportation, in the industrial output and others. Even under the peak of COVID-19, transportation emissions were down by about 30 to 40%. A pandemic is the worst possible way to reduce emissions. And yet, even under a global lockdown, we still had only an emissions reduction of 30, 40%. So the question is now, what kind of system do we bounce back to? Auto sales are down. Some cities are investing in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, but there's been a shift away from public transit. These trends can affect the way that the future unfolds. Next slide, please. So what we're working on is modeling the broad range of plausible futures to, under, to understand and identify robust policy and infrastructure pathways for transportation decarbonization. All right, what does that mean? We can look at how this works for when uh, travel changes, when technology changes, when the grid changes, um, when behavior changes, uh, and, and really try to understand what are the targets within all of those that we need to hit to make sure that we're on track to decarbonizing transportation. Um, one thing really stands out, how much we drive. The next transportation system needs to focus on equitable zero carbon mobility and a just transition while winding down the era of oil. Next slide, please. There are a lot of new technologies emerging in transportation and we model the impact of a lot of these. Automation in shipping, automation in passenger uh, vehicles, micromobility. Um, these technologies could improve the life cycle environmental outcomes, they could improve equity outcomes, or they could make all of these a lot worse. We don't have to wait and regret the next transportation system. We have the opportunity to shape it right now. We as engineers have an ethical responsibility to design a sustainable and equitable future for everyone so that we can look back with pride on this next phase of the transportation system. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Samaras, for your wonderful presentation and the reminder of our ethical obligations as engineers and all the work and research you do. Uh, I'd like to introduce our last panelist, Dr. J Julie Zimmerman. Dr. Zimmerman holds joint appointments as a professor in the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering and School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University. She also serves as the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at FES, as well as the Deputy Director of Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale. 
Her pioneering work established the fundamental framework for her field with her seminal publications on the 12 principles of green engineering in 2003. Dr. Zimmerman is also the co-author of the textbook, Environmental Engineering, Fundamental Sustainability and Design, used throughout the world in the United States in our engineering, environmental engineering courses. In addition, Dr. Zimmerman is Editor-in-Chief for Environmental Science and Technology. Prior to coming to Yale University, Dr. Zimmerman was a program manager at the Uni United States Environmental Protection Agency, where she established the National Sustainable Design Competition P3, People, Prosperity, and Planet. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Zimmerman. Great, thank you so much for the introduction and for those of you following the P3 award, the 18th uh, call for proposals just went out today. So uh, hopefully you'll see that from the EPA and check it out. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the convergence with COVID in terms of the impact healthcare has on the environment and then talk about what a green chemistry future might look like with a neat example that we uh, just launched a new company. So next slide, please. So the first thing to talk about is the impact of the healthcare sector globally. It's about 4.6% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And you'll note the US is quite out of scope with other countries in terms of our emissions per healthcare treatment. Next slide, please. Um, so interestingly enough, if healthcare were a country, it would rank 13th in the world for greenhouse gas emissions. So this presents a really um, a big opportunity, I would say, to bring engineering and chemistry to bear on how we provide healthcare and closes this, this loop on, um, we often think about climate change impacts on health, but this is really providing healthcare and the uh, impacts on climate change. All of this data I'm presenting was before COVID. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and if we dig into this data a little bit, there's lots of opportunities for engineers to get involved in terms of how we reduce the environmental impact of healthcare, whether it's thinking about buildings and architecture, how we do air exchange, um, airflow, travel associated with healthcare, and then looking, of course, at all the materials and chemicals. And we heard recently about PPE uh, just a minute ago. Okay, so next slide. So just like thinking about how we reduce the environmental impact of the medical sector, we could think writ large about the chemical sector. And earlier this year, Science Magazine did an issue um, in their series on tomorrow's earth related to how do you design chemistry to match what um, we want for tomorrow's earth. And so the res resulting paper of that um, is what I'm gonna present now. So next slide. So if we think about the existing chemical sector, it looks a lot like this. We've heard already about linear flows of taking resources that tend to be fossil fuels and putting them through a very linear system, generating waste both at production and post-consumer use. We could also dig in and look at the kinds of chemistry that we're doing and the kinds of chemical engineering processes and the often the reliance on environmental engineers to clean up the landfills and impacts from incineration and emissions to water and air as a result of this process. Next slide. Uh, the other thing we note, of course, is the fence line community impacts of these chemicals um, and the way the com current chemical sector operates. And so there's an opportunity to think about tomorrow's chemical uh, sector to not only address these broad scale environmental impacts and public health concerns, but really these local uh, environmental injustices. Next slide, please. So the article goes into quite detailed uh, description of what tomorrow's chemical sector could look like. Most immediately, you'll note it's moving from a linear process to one that's more circular and in a thoughtful way. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute as this push towards circular economy has emerged in our field. What does that really look like as we operationalize it? Um, and if you dig into some of the underlying attributes of this new chemical sector, it talks about using renewable feedstocks, things that are non-toxic, using biomimicry to inform how we do chemical transformations, um, and uh, changing our definition of what functional performance means to include uh, sustainability as well. So next slide. So this is our latest company that we've launched out of the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering. Uh, it's called Air Company. So this is a catalyst that we've patented and licensed to this um, 
company, the student who was leading this research is actually the CTO associated with the company and it takes carbon dioxide, reacting it in sunlight with water over this catalyst to produce vodka, ethanol. Uh, Ethanol, as Costas talked about, of course, is uh, one of the options in how we move towards fuel, uh, renewable fuel. Um, but you, uh, the economics of e ethanol for fuel are quite hard to overcome, but people will pay 70 or $80 for a liter of vodka. So this is where the company started. Um, next slide though. So uh, this short video will tell you as the company has evolved. So for six months, we have produced vodka. And actually during that time from March through July, uh, the company is based in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, actually switched to producing hand sanitizer to address um, some of the shortages around New York City for healthcare workers. They're back to producing vodka. And if you remember that fence line community that I showed you, this is actually where the chemical plant is located. And so you'll see it's a green space. There's lots of people around. Uh, the community that surrounds this looks really different. And if we think about solving environmental injustices, now we're talking about local economic development. We're actually talking about instead of people fighting NIMBY, not in my backyard for chemical plants to put chemical plants in my community, it creates a tax base, it creates jobs, and it's actually not harmful for public health or the environment. Um, that video that uh, went by was the company just received a really recent contract from NASA to take CO2 and make rocket fuel and other molecules that are relevant if we think about long-term space travel. So if we can take carbon dioxide to ethanol, we can make plastics, we can make building materials um, and uh, change this world towards something that's more carbon negative using green chemistry and green engineering. So next slide. So I'm gonna just talk you through a little bit about the flow here in terms of how we think about designing a green chemistry future. So the first one is function it has to be at the heart and center of what we do. If what we make doesn't do what it's supposed to do, whether it's an adhesive or a paint or a water treatment technology, we're not gonna succeed no matter how sustainable it is. The next question we would ask is, is it made from depleting resources? So if we're relying on fossil fuels, we can't get long-term sustainability from this. We need to move to renewable feedstocks. This includes bio-based feedstocks as well as waste feedstocks such as carbon dioxide or cellulose and lignin, um, chitin, other vastly wide available waste materials from um, uh, industrial processing. Okay, next is to then talk about the toxicity. What is the inherent nature of the chemicals, materials we're making, as well as the transformation or processing we're using to create those products and materials? Um, how do we move towards things that are more benign, inherently safer, so we're less concerned about controlling the circumstances in which these things are utilized? Again, this benefits a public health perspective and addresses environmental injustice. And then finally, the next thing to think about is this idea and this giant push towards the circular economy. But as you really start to dig into this and start thinking about it, there are lots of things that we make and we know as environmental engineers wind up in wastewater treatment plants that are never going to come back into a circular economy, whether it's shampoo, um, pesticides, um, these things are distributed in the environment and are, are, and are intended to be so. And so we actually wanna think whether these things should be made to be degradable versus those things that we wanna to design to be persistent because they have high molecular complexity or because they have high embedded energy. And therefore it makes sense to try to close the loop on those materials versus things that we should not be chasing to bring into a circular economy. So next slide, and it's my last slide, is the difference between the compass and the speedometer. And I know I've laid out quite a bold vision and some um, big goals, but big opportunities for this community. And I would just remind all of us that the most important thing is to orient to true north and that we agree on a path of where we wanna go and what the destination is and maybe worry a little bit less about how fast we can get there. And with that, I'm happy to uh, participate in the discussion and take any questions. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman, uh, for that presentation and all your great work. Uh, really exciting about the company making vodka, but also all of your work in green chemistry and uh, everyone, all the panelists work in general 
trying to address pollution prevention uh, before treatment and for things like green chemistry and others. So I do invite all the panelists to show, uh, turn on their videos uh, and all the attendees, uh, please submit questions in the questions and answers on the bottom uh, right of your panel if you have not already. Uh, we have some standard questions we ask each session uh, that we'll start with and then we'll get to the other uh, submitted questions. I think we have everyone. Okay, so the first question is, uh, what role does equity play in your research and teaching? And how do you incorporate equity in your research and teaching? So this conference uh, is AWSP Converging COVID-19 Environment Health and Equity. So that's equity is a big part of this conference. So that's why we asked this question. Uh, I guess we could go in uh, order from the speakers if you wanna to touch on it, uh, Dr. Ivy. Would you like to talk about how you incorporate equity in your research and teaching? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. I'll start with research. Um, so I am traditionally trained in air quality modeling, which is a very, um, very technically driven field. And so when I became a professor, I realized that I needed to actually <clears throat> uh, paint an umbrella of equity over all of the research that I do. So what that means is applying the tools that um, I have strengths in to directly answer questions related to inequities and in air pollution exposure. And so um, in terms of research writing proposals, the broader impact statements pretty much write themselves um, as far as air pollution is concerned. Um, and I always make sure to try to directly address inequities in my work. And with teaching, um, I actually teach uh, thermodynamics, I teach chemical process analysis, I teach uh, technology of air pollution control, and there is an opportunity to talk about environmental and sustainability issues, equity issues in each of these classes, um, because the end point of um, a lot of these industries is uh, harmful exposures. And so um, uh, the students actually, uh, they enjoy seeing a cradle to grave approach or explanation of how um, various sources impact uh, air pollution and health. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Choi, do you have any comments on equity in research and teaching? Yes, um, actually, as some of you may have already know, um, you know, I'm a faculty member of two independent universities. One is Florida State University and the other one is Florida AEM University. And actually technically I'm the, um, I'm, I can also advise the most university and actually FAMU is one of the HBCUs. So generally the way that I, I, I contribute to the institutional diversity and inclusion is Generally, um, I try to um, give more opportunity to the this um, African American students and also let them know about any opportunity. Because based on my experience, what is happening is that although these African American students they are um, they really want to participate in any research activities and uh, teaching activities, however, sometimes they may not know about this opportunity because of lack of, uh, because of limited access to the information. And also they believe that they, are, they may not be eligible, although that is, not the they, that, is not the, that is not the case. So generally what I generally do, I generally uh, take extra care about how I can disseminate this, any opportunity within my group, within my, also the within my depart department to these uh, underrepresented students and also let them know uh, and also try to um, yeah, try to uh, keep them in the loop of, for the, any, uh, any opportunity. So that is kind of what I generally do within my department. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hobbs, anything to add? Um, I, I know you touched on it in your presentation for the work you do in the community and uh, making sure women of color are 
uh, pursuing engineering in STEM, but. Yes, um, so I'll add that um, engineering is, you know, becoming better at integrating equity into the curriculum and the research. Um, it is still possible for fundamental research to still happen and combine that with um, technology progression and technology integration. But in order for engineering to really solve these real world problems, it needs to uh, work with the community. And we need to look at who has access to what, who receives a burden, who doesn't receive the burden. And that's the responsibility of an engineer to be able to do that. Um, and so that's what I do in my lab. I, I approach that from a systems approach, um, looking at food, energy, water systems, looking, about, looking at how they connect. And then I like going into the communities and soliciting feedback, uh, getting understanding their willingness to adopt the technology. Is it something that's so far fetched that it's you know just not something that's reasonable for the community? And if so, it's something that engineering needs to address. And so that's what we look at a lot in my lab. Um, in terms of teaching, I teach a course, Introduction to Humanitarian Engineering. Um, some of the students are actually online now. So we focus on a lot on the first half of the semester is decentering the technology, really understanding community needs. And then the last part of that class, we're actually designing within constraints. So how do you engineer within constraints? Um, Lastly, I'm just really intentional about recruitment and retention of students of color in my lab. Um, there's just certain um, uh, advocates that are necessary to be able to retain students of color in, in engineering. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs. And I think we can learn a lot from you and your methods. Definitely important to not design technologies in a vacuum without input from the community. So thank you. Dr. Samaras. Thanks. Uh, equity and, and justice are weaved through a lot of the research questions that we ask in, in our group. Um, how does automation affect vulnerable communities? How could it improve public transit um, to uh, underserved communities? How does uh, new energy or other technologies affect communities that have historically been uh, marginalized? And so a lot of our research questions um, have equity and justice uh, threads that run through them. Uh, I'm also very intentional uh, um, about building a supportive um, and, and diverse group uh, and building a, div a supportive and diverse uh, community culture in, inside of our university. Uh, finally, in teaching, I teach our first year engineers and on the first day, the first thing that we talk about is um, the engineer's responsibility to equity and justice and the way that civil environmental engineers, um, just as I mentioned in my talk, um, you know, can have a big impact, positive or negative. Uh, and so these are engineers that may end up not being CEEs, may go be electrical or computer or, or mechanical engineers. And they really have to understand the ethical, um, the engineer's ethical responsibility it's, it's not something extra, it's in the codes of ethics. It's like, this is like, if you don't do this, it's bad. It's not, if you do it, it's good. And so that, I think that we as educators um, can easily uh, make this a standard part of our curriculum um, because we have to, right? Um, and because we should. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and it, look, it seems also the doctors have added racial justice or inequities to the Hippocratic Oath, or some of them at least. So it's very important in ethics of all professions. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman? Yeah, uh, great. So I think there's a couple of points I wanna make on this. One is we've done research to look at issues of environment and sustainability. And when you just bring those topics into the core curriculum, as we've heard about, you see an increased recruitment and retention of women and underrep minorities in engineering and science disciplines. So our very topic and making sure that we're robustly represented in engineering writ large and in science has an impact. Um, I will say the second thing is, um, you know, we're talking a lot about science and technology. I also think about the policy side and there has to be something wrong in the way historically we've done risk assessment or thought about environmental regulations that have led to the environmental injustices that we see. And so as much as we're working on science and technology, I would also 
uh, think that we all need to engage on the policy side about what the failures have been and what EPA over the next 50 years should be doing differently to address that fundamentally. And then um, I think everybody gave great examples about our groups and what we do. I will just speak from the um, perspective of uh, environmental science and technology. We've made a really big effort to, um, one, we just stood up an early career editorial advisory board to try to bring a different generation and a different cohort of people into es &T to make sure we're well positioned for the future of what our field will look like. And I, I have also, um, and work with the editorial team to spend a lot of time with first time authors who are submitting to the journal, again, to try to broaden what that community is and who's participating and publishing in the journal for our field. Great, thank you for those points. Yeah, I think there was a recent publication about uh, publishing or what you should know. <laughs> so that was very useful. Uh, for environmental science and technology, uh, one of the top journals in our field or the top journal. Okay, so the next question was uh, related to the theme of convergence. Uh, and after hearing others on this panel uh, and in general in convergence, how can you we make our research more convergent? So at the risk of uh, having awkward Zoom silence, I'll let anyone volunteer to <laughs> answer that question. Anyone want to talk uh, about convergence or anything they've realized from this presentation? We had people speak on, you know, wastewater, air, uh, green chemistry, all different fields. I, I'll uh, save you the awkward Zoom silence. So I think you hit on it earlier, Kali, and I think the convergence is this idea of moving upstream and how we do design, whether it is transportation systems or chemicals or communities or technologies for those communities. And by bringing all of these ideas into the design phase, it, it does result in synergistic benefits across all the outcomes we're looking for. And so the convergence can really happen very early on at the design phase to address many of the issues that were raised. Thank you. Any other comments or? If anyone thinks of anything that can <laughs> can come back to that. Uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Samaras. I think one new thing that has been emerging that, that COVID has uh, illuminated is the overlap between engineering and environmental engineering and public health um, at, at a broader perception from, from society. Uh, and I think that we as engineers could do a better job um, reaching out and, and having those communities work on our research projects and making sure that we can make a bigger contribution to that space. Uh, yeah, really yeah. important point. Oh, yeah, maybe, sorry. Yeah, I can also add, um, especially, um, so I, uh, so two other co-PIs from the other university and I, we recently um, received the funding from the NSF to establish um, extreme event reconnaissance organization with a focus on um, sustainable disaster debris uh, management, management problem. And actually we, so right now the management group, the, we, are all, we are all engineers. However, we also try to you know, reach out to the um, interdisciplinary scholars, scholars who are interested in this debris management problems, because we look at that, look at this problem as interdisciplinary problem. And uh, without their help, we believe that we cannot effectively, you know, uh, address the, the major challenges. Yeah, great point about engaging all the different fields, public health and others. Uh, Dr. Hobbs. So I was just gonna add what uh, Dr. Summer said, um, COVID has really um, helped with conversion research. Uh, the NIH grant that I'm a part of consists of a medical doctor, a mechanical engineer, and me, an environmental engineer. And it's solely based that we all had resources and instruments and knowledge that could be used to address something that's happening right now. Um, so yeah, so th there are some blessings in disguise that are coming out of COVID and it's, um, it's we're learning a lot from this. 
Great, yeah, great point. Dr. Ivy? Yep, I just wanted to make a suggestion as far as convergent research is concerned, um, is that people that work in the same media in some way, whether you work on air, whether you're working on the emissions, the transport, the exposure, or the direct air capture, and these elements, um, they span a lot of different disciplines, uh, chemical engineering, environmental engineers, public health people. If you're working in the same media, I think we should encourage each other to, to talk to one another a, a lot more often, um, uh, especially if any part of your research is related to that media. So that's my recommendation. Yeah, definitely we need to have more interactions. I know we're all very busy, but uh, definitely important to reach convergence. So now I'll turn to uh, some pre-submitted and submitted questions. Dr. Trotz, uh, can you ask the first one? Sure. Um, this one is actually directed towards Julie and it says referencing the vodka plant in Brooklyn Navy Yard, redevelopment of that area only took place after at least a decade of gentrification. What steps would existing chemical plants and communities of color need to do in order to create these green spaces without driving out the existing population? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it's um, important to remember that there's lots of opportunity in um, brownfields redevelopment and this idea of bringing in chemical or material or processing plants that are based on green chemistry and green engineering and following that design flowchart I talked about changes um, where those chemical plants can go and why a community would want or not want a facility like that around. So this is really about changing the inherent nature of the kind of chemical um, manufacturing we do. And then um, I actually think if we do this well, having these kinds of plants located in brownfields creates opportunities to help uh, revitalize neighborhoods, again, bringing in a tax base and jobs to a place um, where historic damage has been done by the very same sector. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another question? Oh, there are quite a few. Um, so this okay. is for the entire group there. Have there been any efforts that you're aware of to standardize equity within courses, textbooks and or research design? such as advocating that race or ethnicity be a central part of results in studies and not just a discussion point. Any volunteers? I know Dr. Zimmerman's a co, uh, well, Dr. Ivy. I've heard uh, across some schools in the UC that students are actually strongly requesting, I won't say demanding that equity modules be entered or be a part of engineering classes. So this is a student-led movement from what I've seen. Yeah, and then I think what Colleen was uh, alluding to is in this textbook that uh, Jim Mihelsik and I um, wrote along with lots of other co-authors on um, fundamentals of environmental engineering, there is uh, throughout the book woven a theme of equity. We present the very early data showing toxic release inventory overlaid with socioeconomic status and you can visually very quickly see. And so asking students to think about um, where um, landfills are located, where incinerators are located, and there's homework exercises and example problems throughout the book that kind of reinforce that Theme. I don't know if that's a standard, but if it gets uh, to have that in the curriculum, in the textbook that's being used to teach all the uh, traditional and conventional fundamentals of environmental engineering. Yeah. Any other panelists, have you seen more standardization of equity? I know after this summer, it seems there's been a larger push and uh, there's still a long way to go. Uh, and as Dr. Ivy said, yeah, students are demanding it as well. So hopefully we'll see more standardization. Dr. Samaras. I know we at Carnegie Mellon um, are 
making efforts to standardize it within our own curriculum that many faculty had been doing it and already had been doing it for a long time. Um, I think it would be nice if it came from uh, AES, AESP or ABET. Um, and until we get to that point, I think we can have a bottom-up driven um, process where we're sharing best practices and, and incorporating this as a standard part of our curriculum. Thank you. And yeah, I've seen a lot more studies focusing on equity, but it seems more the surface. This is inequitable, but getting more to the root causes and how we address them and how we design research for equity will be important. Uh, Dr. Trotz, another question? Sure. This is Hope Hoffman, and she says she's concerned about the waste generated by single-use PPE, the masks and face shields which contain plastics, especially as their use is normalized. So what can be done to get ahead of this before this debris makes its way to rivers and oceans? Um, so actually, we also heard a lot about uh, this concern from the multiple waste management sectors. Um, actually, this um, generally, I can see that two like um, general approaches to address this kind of plastic contamination issue. I think I mentioned some these two approaches during my presentation. Generally, um, in the case where they have the incineration facilities, I know it's not very. It doesn't sound like very uh, environmental friendly. However because of these waste contamination issues, they generally send most of the, these plastics to the incineration facilities. And then second, that I we can see from the from California, they generally just let them um, just stay for a longer period of time. Generally, they just stay, let have them stay for at least three days before uh, they start sorting this uh, recyclable from the mix of the other waste, because as you may know, recycling facilities they we most of in most of the material recovery facilities they still rely on the people in sorting and segregating and separating the recyclables. Um, actually, we I didn't we didn't hear much about the possible any possibility of the, this plastic waste. Um, going to the rivers or any like water stream uh, because we generally talk about the some of the like we generally talk about the, any issues in um, treating and processing and disposing of the daily municipal solid waste. Thanks, Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry, Colleen. No, it's okay. I don't know if, because Dr. Zimmerman uh, touched on how healthcare is the 13th in the world in greenhouse gas emissions, if she had any comments about the PPE waste. Um, sure. I mean, I think this is as PPE waste or any other plastics we talk about, it's the nature of these materials. And we get into this conversation of plastics are bad, but it's bad plastics are bad. And there's some polymers that we somehow define as being okay. And there are natural polymers. And again, this is really changing the nature of the kinds of chemicals we use, thinking about obedient materials. How do you have a material that is stable when you want it to be, and then is triggered by something it would see either in a formal waste management system or an informal um, waste management. Um, and then you know, degrade and not degrade into something like microplastics, but truly mineralize into CO2. So I think there's lots of fundamental research opportunities in this space. Yeah, great point. And I should also not <laughs> mention all plastics are bad. There are some natural polymers, of course. Great point. Yeah, Dr. Trotz, other questions? Well, there, I'm not sure if this panelist can answer it, but there was a question on a follow up on the microplastics, and it was the whether there was concern of possible health impacts from people breathing in microplastics from wearing single use plastic masks day in and, and day out. Does anyone have any thoughts? I don't know, Dr. Ivy with air pollution, but it's not completely related. We to... might shoot that one back to panel two or three, session two or three. So um, there was a question that was answered in on, on, on the Q&A, but I think there needs to be some clarification. So I'll ask it out loud. 
Um, it was how do you access the wastewater of positive people? And that's from someone named Tina White. So Shakira, Dr. Hobbs, can you um, respond? Yes, so um, I guess there's several ways you can access it. So what we're doing in our study, we're getting it from the wastewater treatment plant, the local wastewater treatment plant. And so these are from residential areas, hospitals, prisons, um, industrial plants that are nearby. So anywhere that's in this local range. Um, now there are researchers that are getting wastewater directly from buildings, or you may be hearing a lot that um, dorms are having their wastewater surveillance. Um, so um, you can tap into building facilities, can um, access the wastewater from that building and be able to test it and see if there is an outbreak or um, potential testing or more testing that needs to be done um, for COVID. So um, I think this question is more so related to the privacy issue. So we're not so much um, looking at like who is positive. It's just so looking for the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA so that um, we can be able to manage it better. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Ivy, you were gonna say something earlier. Just wanna make sure <laughs> about the microplastics or we're good. Okay, so Dr. Trotz, to the next question. Sure, and this is coming from AESP's president, Dr. Joel Ducast. He asks, how do we encourage our colleagues in other disciplines to be more thoughtful about green chemistry and also about educating future engineers, which goes back to, I think, some of the equity questions. I guess that's for me. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there's this opportunity again to, you know, build this into textbooks. There's opportunity to, um, change some of the questions around uh, calls for proposals and the things we're asked to respond to. So broader impacts could be more specified about pushing people towards the direction of sustainability and sustainable design. Um, I'm a good academic, so I will always say, you know, the funding agency is putting in uh, uh, incentives for interdisciplinary collaboration drives professors um, and researchers to behave in a certain way. And so there's opportunities to do uh, that kind of work there. And then this is, to me, is a much broader question about, you know, uh, standards we use for tenure and promotion and um, how we evaluate interdisciplinary work and asking people to work at these interfaces in terms of getting credit in their home discipline versus recognizing the benefits that some people might be more reductionist in their research versus people who are more broad and thinking in systems. Thank you. Dr. Hobbs, you said you worked with mechanical engineers or other fields. Have you, do you have any comments on colleagues in other disciplines to be more thoughtful in green chemistry and sustainability? Um, well, yeah, in terms of sustainability. So, um, you know, uh, in March or April, there was a shortage of PPE. And some colleagues of mine that work in the biomedical field, um, they were having difficulties getting pipette tips, right? And so working in the field of biology or biomedical, you typically don't reuse pipette tips because maybe you're working with something that needs to be sterile, right? So this calls into question, uh, do we need to you know, discover more ways where we can recycle and reuse pipette tips, even for uh, people who work in those fields, right? Um, so there are some interesting things that are coming from this. Thank you. Dr. Trotz, another question? Yes. Um, we have Jean McRae who's been sending questions every week. So this is great. Thank you for that. Uh, she says, thanks to all the panelists for the great work. As the urgency of acting to limit climate change increases, do you have any thoughts on how to create buy-in for large scale change? 
again, beyond our field. We seem a bit stuck between people digging in their heels and others pushing for rapid change. Yeah, Dr. Summers. I think that there's a, a cliche and a punting when this question comes up, which is like, well, we have all the technology that we want. All we need is political will. Okay, well, the political will doesn't just appear out of thin air. It needs to be built as a coalition. Um, it, it needs to be um, built with the voices of, of folks who have been outside of coalitions for a long time and who have been marginalized. And so I do think that, again, we as engineers um, can't, uh, can't afford to only look at the tech. We have to think about how the tech affects society and how that might encourage the, a durable coalition for change. And so what does that mean? It means that when we're proposing or designing um, tech in our profession to understand how it would affect um, different communities, but also how it might benefit different communities and what might be a, a large scale program for change. Um, you know, uh, one just, Ba you know, baseline idea here while we're throwing out policy ideas is, you know, to re to, to mitigate the lead and um, asbestos from uh, water lines, from public schools, from buildings, uh, and also um, reinvest in in our public school system, so that we have that every community would be able to feel the benefits immediately, rather than concentrating them in um, in some you know large large cities, and so that that we have to think about ways that we build that political will as engineers, not just say, well, that's somebody else's problem. A great point. Uh, I don't know if other panelists have comments. I know Dr. Zimmerman, your last slide had the compass and then the speedometer. <laughs> Here. Yeah, I think um, this is exactly what Custer was saying. So I think, you know, it, it's, uh, and I don't want to get political, but it really is marrying climate change with other societal benefits. So how does this intersect with jobs? How does this intersect with issues of equity? How do we solve other societal problems that also solve our challenges around climate change? Um, so I think that helps to build the political will if you can pivot the conversation around um, process and how we get there and instead talk about what is the means, the ends that we're trying to realize and what are different pathways to getting there. Um, and many of those will wind up also being beneficial for climate change. So I think we need to change the conversation to build that kind of political will. And again, I'm a little bit biased, but I do think starting to think about how CO2 has economic value as an industrial feedstock also changes the market mechanisms around um, capturing CO2 and using it for fuels, for chemicals, for building materials, for plastics. Great. Dr. Trotz. There is a, a follow-up on that. Um, I was wondering if the panelists could, could give some more concrete steps um, of things that could be taken at the societal and governmental level to sort of reach the net zero emissions or to address the equity issues. So, so what are some things that, you know, either AESP can do or that we could do as individual faculty or programs that are, have been successful to train our engineers to do more of this stuff? Dr. Ivy? <laughs> well, if, if, if I heard correctly, uh, I heard uh, what are the concrete steps we could take? Was it at the government level or at the faculty level? Well, they, 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 they didn't ask for concrete steps. They asked if you have any insight on the steps that could be taken. And so I was just wondering if we could give some, some examples of things that we are already doing that you know, should be amplified. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot a little bit. Um, this is a, this may be an issue of how different energy sectors are subsidized at the federal level. Um, if we start investing more in the greener and low carbon intensity or zero carbon technologies, uh, investing in those and perhaps pulling resources away from 
uh, energy production that brings that takes us away from our climate goals. I think that's probably the most dead on way to to address our climate issues. And um, the most that we can do is continue to uh, produce our papers that support this and provide the data that support this. Um, but if our if the people that fund these operations don't listen to us, I, I'm not really sure what we as individuals can do to stop these large systems that are perturbing the climate. So, yeah, Doug. <laughs> yes. Um, actually, uh, one of the interesting things that we, we found is actually one of the uh, participating uh, waste systems is we, we have one small like town uh, from New York and then actually their town was their town is one of the EPA's zero waste cities. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about this initiative and actually for them recycling is mandatory. One thing that we found very interesting is generally one of the biggest concerns we found across the different most of the waste management sectors is reduction in the revenue because of the because of the decrease in the commercial waste and also generally uh, from the recycling perspective cardboard and plastic they are the most val valuable material for recycling however they are so worried about the waste contamination of the workers because generally uh, at the time when waste is come uh, waste comes to the facility they are in a mix with others. So they have to touch the material and then segregate them. However, in the case of the, these zero waste city, the town name of the town is the New Pelt. They are already, at the time when they receive the material, they are already well segregated from the other material. So they don't, there's a less concern about the waste contamination. And also at the same time, they are able to, you know, recycle the highest number of the material compared to the non-pandemic uh, situation. So I think it looks like maybe uh, doing more recyclable, I think sustainable waste management system may be more resilient to the pandemic. So that is, we are getting to the conclusion right now. Yeah. Great point uh, that these systems can be more resilient to natural and human-made disasters. Uh, Dr. Hobbs, you had your hand raised? Yes, so in the theme of convergent research, this is a great opportunity to uh, partner with behavior scientists. Let's understand what are some of the, the reasons um, why people are not doing this or why they are doing it. We're looking at buy-in, we're looking at human behavior, uh, we're looking at what people are comfortable with. So let's team up with behavior scientists to try to understand, um, do people respond more to incentives or do they respond more to penalties where they have to pay uh, a fee for doing a certain behavior? behavior. Um, but I think that would be a way or a start to start addressing some of these issues or resistance or uncertainty about climate change. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman? Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree. So I think for a long time for um, environment, we have largely played half a policy strategy, which has been the regulatory side, and we are not as good on the um, incentives and innovation, encouraging innovation side. And there's huge policy opportunities there, whether it's um, research and development tax credits, it's patent life extension, um, this idea of driving things towards continuous improvement. There's lots of work, on, again, a little bit outside of the engineering realm, but thinking about um, accounting standards being listed on stock exchanges and having to show a commitment to equity or sustainability as a company um, in order to play in some of the financial markets. So there's lots of policy levers out there that have not been exploited yet at that scale, let alone at the individual scale as Dr. Hobbs was referring to. Yeah, all great points. Uh, Dr. Somers, you had your thumbs up or did you have anything you <laughs> wanted to mention? I was just giving an emoji in real life. 
Uh, thank you. And of course, on time, the municipal solid waste is coming. So sorry for any background noise. Uh, yeah, Dr. Somers, I know you do a lot of um, writing and like media and like uh, uh, news articles. Is there any comments about making this kind of a societal and government change through that or things you've learned? You know, I think that engineers and, and scientists, folks in this community have a lot of knowledge that shouldn't just sit on shelves. Um, uh, and we have a responsibility to do great science and do great engineering, get it peer reviewed, get it published, and then um, take these conclusions and distill them in, and communicate them to the public. And it doesn't have to be an either or, right? It's something that we can, um, we can try to do all of this um, it needs to be recognized by uh, our academic communities, which I think it's becoming more and more. But even individually as, as researchers, um, you know, the community wants to hear from you, right? They, they believe in the work that you're doing and you have a lot of institutional knowledge um, and you could pair that with local knowledge to make some real change in, in your community. So um, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, push your work beyond um, you know, our, our academic networks. Great, thank you. Uh, do, we probably should close soon. Do, is there one last question, Dr. Trotz? There was one last one on PFAS. And so it was, um, as we move away from fluoride-based chemicals, how can we ensure that the replacements aren't worse? After all, it took decades to show the detrimental health effects of PFAS. Dr. Zimmerman? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think PFAS, phthalates, um, bisphenol A. So you can talk about all these chemicals that went through the EPA um, and international chemicals management policy programs and emerged as viable um, for use. And then we wait, right, for a public health impact before we turn around and regulate. And so we need to change that model. Um, and this gets back to the underlying approach to risk assessment of who can be harmed and how much, and that's uh, how much we allowed out in the environment from a societal uh, harm perspective. And so lots of new tools are coming out that um, our community has a great role to play around uh, understanding how chemicals and molecules fundamentally interact with biological systems or natural systems. What is it about that molecule in terms of its physical chemical properties? And then how do you design those chemicals so they have the function you want without those hazards? Um, and so this gets back to all the work that we normally do as environmental engineers to figure out fate and transport and um, of a molecule based on its chemical properties. And so using that now to inform safer design from a toxicity perspective. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I know we're getting to time, so I'd like to conclude now. So thank you to all our amazing panelists for their insightful presentations and answering questions. We appreciate all of our attendees on Zoom or YouTube today or later asynchronously. Thank you to our sign language interpreters and closed captioners to help make our session more accessible. Also a huge thanks to those on the organizing committee behind the scenes. And thank you to my grandmother without her inspiration and emphasis on education, I would not be here moderating this session for you all today. So as we close today, I invite you to maybe close your eyes and envision the future without pollution or waste. Imagine a world without landfills or litter or food waste where all products and items are designed for disassembly and a sustainable end of life. A future where we utilize green chemistry instead of toxic and hazardous chemicals. Imagine a world where many less people die and suffer from cancer, toxicity, and air pollution. Imagine a world where the environment is clean and we are not finding plastics and, the, and toxins in the bellies of birds and fish and other animals. In the context of COVID-19, the necessity of a future without pollution or waste is ever more apparent, particularly for Black, Hispanic, Indigenous, and other underserved communities that are disproportionately impacted by waste and pollution and COVID-19. That future is possible given the talks we heard today and commitment from environmental engineers and scientists and everyday citizens like all of you listening. I challenge you to commit even more after the session to make that future a reality. 
Thank you for the opportunity to be your moderator today. And I now invite Dr. Trotz to close the session. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you to everyone for an amazing session. Um, we'd like to remind everyone that they can go on the AESP Convergent COVID 19.org or take a picture of this QR code to get to the quiz um, that, that addresses the question um, with questions from this session. And you do get credit. You get credit for Envision um, credentials, and you also get a certificate from. ASP Converging COVID-19. We have our last session that comes next week and we're looking at climate change mitigation and adaptation. So do tune in again at 12 p.m. next Friday. I'd like to again thank our sponsors, um, the National Science Foundation, AESP, and of course the University of California Merced and University of South Florida and to the staff and students who are behind the scenes working on this um, conference. Thank you everyone and have a safe weekend. And from all of us, Colleen, Dr. Naughton, very um, sincere condolences on the passing of your grandmother.